Jack? Yeah. She believed she was being stealthy, but she had no idea that I had learnt about everything from her colleague, who was outraged by what was going on. I made my plans and prepared. Fortunately, I had time to control my emotions and prepare for what was about to happen. It would all start today, just after dinner. Kayla tonight. Then Mary, my pal, asked, Yeah, I am finally going to do it. I'll wait until after dinner, bring him a beer, and then tell you what happened. I responded, Just remember to be strong. He won't like it, but you must be firm. I will keep that in mind. As we mentioned, he has no choice. This is how it will be. And if he genuinely loves me, he will allow me to do this for my own happiness. That's correct. Just be ready for him to rant and scream. He will resist, but he will finally come to terms with the new reality. It's critical that you remain cool, but forceful. Allow him to have his tantrum, and he'll know you're in control. That's correct. Besides, as far as he knows, this is only temporary. Once he accepts it, he will begin to like it. Then it will simply keep going. Are you certain about all this? Jack can be really stubborn. Look, Kayla... Jack loves you more than anything in the world. Sure, he'll get upset, but once he settles down, he'll realize how much he loves you and will go to any length to make you happy. Even that. Okay. I believe you're the expert. Trust me. I had to ruin two marriages before I figured it out. However, by my third marriage, I had perfected the process. You have met my present husband. He is now fully under my authority. He even stands next to the bed when I'm with someone else. I also occasionally have him tidy up afterward. A month from now, another Jack will join the queue. Then you can be certain in the security of your marriage to Jack, as well as the pleasure of several other men. I finished the day and went home to prepare Jack's favorite dinner. When Jack arrived home, he welcomed me with, I love you, and kissed me on the cheek as usual. Despite my best attempts, I felt nervous. This was going to be a big step and shift in our marriage, but it was all worthwhile. Mary has been telling me about her feminine marital ministry for quite some time. I've personally witnessed it work for her and her spouse. He was very pleased with how their marriage ended out. I'm sure Jack would enjoy it too. The chat during supper was pleasant. We shared stories from the previous day and spoke about some of the day's headlines. It was a relaxed dinner for us. After dinner, I urged he get a beer and rest while I cleaned up. He hesitated a little, wanting to help, but I convinced him it wasn't too much and I could manage it. The leftovers were stored. The dishes were loaded into the dishwasher, and it was time to pour myself a glass of wine, mentally prepare, and head into the living room for the chat. Jack, honey, we need to chat, I began. Sure, honey. What is this about? Okay, Jack, I understand this may be tough for you to accept right now, but it is something I really need to do. Please remember that this is only temporary. So what do you need? If it's that important to your happiness, I'll do everything I can. So far, he's handled it well, not even bothered. That is good. We've talked about having kids, and I'm almost ready for it. But I have a few other things to do before. It should just take a few months at most. Then we may work on having children. That is amazing, baby. So what are the things you need to do? Here it is. I took a deep breath, preparing for the reaction. So, Jack, I need to explore a little before settling down permanently. It will only be temporary, and then I will be the best wife and mother to our children you could hope for. Okay, my darling. That sounds reasonable. So far. But how are you going to go about it? Wow. He's managing things well. I anticipated him to flip out. I will be seeing other men for a bit. We will continue to make love on a regular basis, but I will also make love with other males to cleanse my mind. Remember, it's only lovemaking with them. You are the only person who has my love. I will get back to you in a few months. Be your faithful wife again, and we can begin working on having the children we have planned. Kayla, you don't appear to be asking for my consent. So I am assuming you have made up your mind. I'd like to make it clear that I'm not in support of it. If you ask for permission, I will not give it. However, you are an adult woman, and I will not stop you if you believe it is necessary. Things were going better than I expected. He did not raise his voice. I said it in conversation. Mary must be correct. Jack will accept the new job that I am preparing him for. So, Kayla, how does this work? Are you moving out or do you expect me to? Are you bringing them here or going to their home or hotel? Well, we'll both continue to live here. We are married. And, as I have stated, we intend to continue making love. The other males will just make love with you. It will involve making love. 
I may go see them or bring them here. In such instances, you will have to sleep in the extra bedroom. I don't understand why we need a hotel room when we can just remain here. Again, I'm not in favor, but we shouldn't make love while this. I won't risk contracting any STDs after you're done. We will wait till you have been tested and cleared. Have fun. Do not worry about me. Well, Jack, you can't say I'm not disappointed. I love you and appreciate our lovemaking, but I can understand your anxiety. I'll just have to live with it. That is amazing, honey. So when are you going to start your little flings? So, Mary and I plan to go to a club and meet a couple of guys from work tomorrow night. I'm not sure if that will happen, but I might invite one of them back for the night. Since you're not going to be making love with me while I'm doing it, maybe you should just relocate into a spare room for the next few months. Carla, do not worry about it. I'll finish moving in by the time you come home tomorrow night. Jack remarked this before returning to reading the paper. I couldn't believe how mature he was about the entire situation. My heart soared. Sure, he complained weakly and refused to make love, but he was absolutely open to anything. He was not in the least bit angry. Mary was totally correct. In two months, Jack would be under my control. Besides, I knew that this lack of lovemaking would only be temporary. In a week or so, he'd be back in my bed. Then I'd simply use the volunteer wrench to get him to truly embrace his new status as my obedient little husband. Update. Hello, Mary. It's Kayla. Hello, girl. So how was it last night? My God, you would not believe how mature Jack was about everything. I was expecting him to go nuclear, but he didn't even raise his voice. He was very peaceful and accepting of everything. Wow, that's great. I told you he would comply. Do you think you'll be able to get him to watch tonight? I doubt it. In fact, I doubt I will even suggest it. He stated he wouldn't make love with me while I was with someone else. I'm confident that will not last long. After a week or two of using his hands and knowing he has a lovely woman by his side, he'll be back. That could be a lot of fun, given his refusal to touch me. I just moved him to the extra room. He's packing his belongings now. He agreed to entirely leave the owner's bedroom before I returned home tonight. Ha! I liked how you changed the name from master bedroom to owner's bedroom. I'll have to start doing that myself. Definitely. Anyway, I think I should get ready. I will meet you at the club. Okay. Bye. Bye. Later that night, Jack had made considerable work in boxing up everything from my bedroom. I wasn't clear why he needed to pack when he could simply carry armfuls of belongings down the corridor, but he said it was better that way. It would be less traveling, and he could sift through everything, leaving the things he didn't need in boxes to be disposed of. I suppose that made sense, but I was too busy getting ready to pay attention. He did comment on how attractive I looked in my underwear, garter belt, stockings, and five-inch loafers. He said nothing. I donned the small red cocktail dress I received for our fifth anniversary last year. I only wore it once, but I looked great in it. I told Jack I was going out and anticipated to return around 1 a.m. I explained that he didn't need to wait for me because I might not be alone. After saying this, I grabbed my clutch and prepared to go. He encouraged me not to worry stating that he would have moved out by the time I returned, as promised. He closed the last box as I exited the house. I felt uneasy, but I couldn't figure out why. Despite this, I chose to ignore it, shifting my attention to the expected pleasure and excitement of the night at the club. I met Mary, Larry, and Josh. According to Mary and a few other office girls, the account managers are known for their attractiveness and reported endowment. While Jack was well endowed, the prospect of encountering a significantly larger member piqued my interest, especially given the notion that they knew how to use their assets effectively. In the middle of a chat, Mary inquired about Jack's shift to the spare bedroom. When our first order arrived, I confirmed that he had finished packing and told me that he would be fully moved out by the time I returned. Josh questioned Jack's statement after providing this information. I confirmed recalling Jack's words when I specified my estimated return time. Our group came out laughing at the comment, and Larry joked that he was disappointed Jack had moved out since he had hoped to include him in a sexual context. I jokingly proposed that, with some persuading, we could discuss such plans during the banter. I noticed that neither Larry nor Josh had issued an offer to dance, over numerous hours. We danced and drank. I danced with both of them on several occasions— especially during slow songs when we held tightly, feeling their hardness against me all night. 
their hands stayed on my backside. Later, Mary and I took a break and went to the ladies' room to review the night's events. We settled on the conclusion of the travel home after three rounds of rock, paper, scissors, with me driving Josh and Mary accompanying Larry. When we arrived at the house, I led Josh through the front door, noting that it was dark inside. I imagined Jack had gone to bed by then, convincing myself that everything was fine. Anyway, we didn't need him watching. I walked Josh down the hall to my room. Of course, Jack's belongings were gone. Perhaps I should thank him by offering him a job. There would be something to consider later. Right now, I had other things that needed my attention. We didn't take long to undress, but Josh wanted me to keep my garter belt and stockings on. I'd lost my thong a few hours ago. Not sure if it was Larry's or Josh's. It did not matter. I earned enough money to buy others. The next two hours were pure delight. We started in one position and then shifted to another to avoid weariness too early. We finished the round with Cowgirl. After a little pause, I relished when he spanked my ass while I rode him. Perhaps I'll let Jack do it for his birthday or our anniversary. But it would not happen again. I would save it for my other lovers. We ended up taking a shower before heading to bed. We woke up again the next morning. Josh then had to leave to be with his wife and children. So I got into my robe and went to fetch some coffee. I was a little disappointed that Jack hadn't brewed coffee yet, given that it was now past nine o'clock. He'd usually been awake for an hour at this point. I planned to discuss it with him later. I mean, would it hurt him to prepare my coffee and breakfast? Particularly when I stayed up late? So much for the handy work I planned to give him as a reward for moving into the spare bedroom while I was away. After I finished my breakfast bagel, I went to the shower and dressed. Since I had no plans for the day, the warm water worked wonders to soothe my stiff muscles. I chose for my old shorts and a t-shirt because I was only going to be around Jack. I donned a functional bra and an old pair of ordinary underwear as I completed pulling my hair into a ponytail. The telephone rang. Hello, girlfriend. It was Mary. Hello, seductive creature. So how was Josh last night? He was great. It was just what I expected. How did Jack react this morning? I do not know. I'm a little upset since he appears to be asleep. I was disappointed that he did not prepare my food and coffee this morning. I was considering offering him a part-time job in exchange for moving into the extra room. But now I don't believe so. Yes. Make sure he understands how unhappy you are and what you expect from this situation. Continue to be forceful with him, but make sure to give him tiny rewards when he does something right. This will motivate him to try harder. I'm starting to get upset that he hasn't gotten up yet. Wait a minute. While I drag his sluggish ass out of bed, I walk down the hall to the guest bedroom and bang on the door, calling his name. No response. I tried again. Still no response. I finally turned the knob and flung the door open. I yelled, Crap! What is wrong? Mary asked over the phone. Jack is not in the spare bedroom. His clothes are not even in the closet. Wait, I said, going through the house. Crap, his truck is gone, as are all of his tools. That little stirring in the back of my mind was beginning to take shape. No, I gave a gasp. What? What is it? Mary asked. Jack moved out. I now understand what he was talking about. He never indicated he'd relocate his belongings to the spare room. He merely claimed he would transfer his belongings out of my room. Then he stated that he would move in before I returned. I assumed he meant he'd move out of my room, but he meant out of the entire house. Crap. I need to phone him and find out where he has gone. No, this is incorrect. It conveys him a message of vulnerability. You've got to keep strong. Do not contact him. Allow him to contact you. Trust me. Right now, he's having a minor tantrum. In a few days, he will crawl back to you. This is actually a very positive thing. You now have a motive to punish him and make him beg for something in exchange for allowing him to return. It accelerates the process. I'm sure you could even let Josh or Larry knock you up and force Jack to raise the baby. Are you certain about that? I am sure. Look at what my hubby does for me. Well, I must confess that you have been correct thus far. Of course I am. Larry would like to meet you in the supply closet at work for an hour on Monday. Can we actually get away with that? Sure. At least half of the girls are doing it. It's so severe that I have to put it on a timetable. I will email you the meeting time. Just schedule an appointment somewhere else. Do not worry about it. The boss never goes there, and everyone who needs something from there knows to ask me first. We talked for a few more minutes before hanging up the phone. 
I must admit that despite my actions, I was concerned about Jack's move. I honestly adore him and want to spend my life with him. Mary's image of a feminine lifestyle seemed enticing, allowing me to explore numerous males. I intend to end other relationships, but Jack will remain my dedicated and subservient spouse. Perhaps in a few years I can persuade Jack to let me tie him down in exchange for ceasing contact with other guys. Of course, this will only occur when I am ready to give it up. He doesn't need to know that. Yes, I could include binding as a condition for his return. I'd have to think about that regardless. I needed to recoup from the previous night and prepare for a busy day at work tomorrow. I brushed it off, made a basic meal, had a glass of wine, and went to bed. Throughout the week, Jack remained silent. Mary told me that it wasn't altogether unexpected and that he will call me shortly. The longer he was absent, the more conditions I could set for his return. This week, I'd been seeing Larry, Josh, and a couple of other gorgeous guys in the pantry every day, with a double-team session with Larry and Josh planned for this afternoon, Friday morning. Larry, Josh, Mary, and I talked during our coffee break in front of the machine. A professionally dressed woman approached us and asked whether we were Kayla Adams, Mary Morgan, Josh Johnson, and Larry Jones. After we introduced ourselves, she handed each of us an envelope and immediately snapped photos with a little digital camera. She remarked that we had all been served and then proceeded to our boss's office. I called after her and asked what it was about, to which she replied in a beautiful southern voice that she was hired to distribute them as a joke, not to read them. She entered her boss's office without knocking. Less than a minute later, she merrily exited the building, wishing us good day. We opened our envelope simultaneously and discovered divorce papers citing marital cheating as the grounds. I was paralyzed in shock. Josh and Larry's phones rang shortly after their wives had gotten evidence of their infidelity. Their belongings were about to be discarded, and they were to take turns sleeping. The divorce papers were about to be filed. Our boss's voice echoed throughout the office, showing frustration. He arrived in the doorway unexpectedly, yelling loudly enough to be heard throughout the office. He summoned Adams, Morgan Johnson, and Jones to his office immediately. As we walked by him with bent heads and entered his office, I felt a sense of doom. The door slammed behind us. Once inside, he expressed his dissatisfaction, underlining that the situation was more than just bad. He demanded an explanation while waving a manila envelope, but none of us dared to respond. He then informed us that the corporation was facing a lawsuit for not following the moral code mentioned in our employee handbook. He questioned whether any of us could understand the reason for such legal action. Once again, we were unable to react. He took it upon himself to clarify the situation, explaining that the lawsuit was based on charges against Mrs. Adams, Mr. Jones, and Mr. Johnson for inappropriate behavior, while Mrs. Jones Morgan was accused of converting the storage room into a business brothel. He challenged us to dispute the charges and inquired whether any of the incidents occurred during business hours or on company property. With no answer from us, he became frustrated and attacked our behavior, claiming that the court order prohibited him from firing us until the issue was resolved. He told us to leave his office until he thought out how to address the matter while keeping our heads down. We left his office and headed to our room. Following that episode, my job became substantially more difficult, but I was grateful to still be employed. When I decided to review the divorce petition, I found how serious it was. It includes photographs, films, audio recordings, and even notarized letters. An hour later, the boss sent a company-wide email to all staff. Management had become aware that workers had regularly planned and carried out actions that violated the moral code of conduct outlined in the employee handbook during working hours and on company property. Given the possibility that the situation was more prevalent than documented, extreme action was declared due to confusion about which personnel were implicated. All employees were required to read and understand the employee handbook's moral code. An online lesson would be created over the weekend, and each employee would be required to complete it by the following Friday. Security would make spot inspections on all secluded places throughout the day, a practice that would continue until permanent security cameras were installed for monitoring. The storage room would then be locked, with the key held by the security supervisor. Any materials need must be brought in with a security escort. The security supervisor would actively monitor computer usage to prevent personal use of business resources. 
scheduled non-work-related meetings with co-workers or others, accessing non-work-related websites, and non-work-related text messaging on corporate computers were all prohibited. Socializing with co-workers should take place in the break room during planned breaks and lunch periods. Security staff would patrol the facility to ensure compliance, but the identities of people responsible for the conduct would not be revealed. Two minutes later, my inbox was flooded with hate letters from co-workers. After work, the other three and I went to a bar across the street and sat at a little table in the corner. We received critical looks from other co-workers at Friday happy hour. We still have work to do, at least for a while. That was incredibly kind of him. What do you think, Jack? I inquired about adding that in the court order. Josh ignored it, implying that Jack was not attempting to cause minimal damage, but rather meant to inflict additional suffering. When I asked for clarity, Josh explained the alimony reference. He stated that while infidelity is the current reason for the divorce, having a secure job and income may prohibit a judge from granting alimony. He warned against the possibility of not finding another employment if laid off, which may persuade a sympathetic judge to offer financial assistance. The advice was to stay at the employment until the divorce was finalized. Larry suggested after the divorce that if all four of us were laid off, there would be no alimony or employment. Josh replied that in such a circumstance, he will retire on Monday. Larry joked about being a natural blonde, hinting that retiring voluntarily could have legal consequences. He said that resigning after filing for divorce may be interpreted as an attempt to obtain support from the spouse, which could result in bad judgments from a judge. The recommended course of action was to keep the job and save money. Josh voiced anxiety about his and my circumstances, underlining the possibility that their wives may obtain alimony and child support as a result of having children. He considered the obstacles they would confront if laid off. Given that alimony and child support were calculated based on income at the time of divorce, the situation did not appear good. Recognizing the potential ramifications, I felt compelled to speak with Jack and attempt to settle our issues, despite wanting to help my buddies. The prospect of losing my partner caused me to reevaluate my priorities during a period of self-reflection. I reconsidered my earlier plans and decided that if I had to value my marriage over my friendships, I would do whatever it took to keep it. I quickly retrieved my cell phone and received a message claiming that the number I dialed did not accept calls from my number. Frustrated, I demanded Mary's phone number, stating that Jack had banned my number and that I needed to discuss the storm issue with him. When Mary tried to call him on her phone and received the same message, it became clear that he had also blocked her number when Larry advised calling him. I hesitated, worried about the ramifications of contacting my husband from one of my friend's phones and conceding the difficulties of reaching him by phone. I felt panicked since Jack had most likely barred both my home and business phones. Recognizing that talking on the phone might be ineffective, I resolved to seek him out in person. The need to find him and address the situation face-to-face -face outweighed any qualms about societal expectations for women in marriage. Reflecting on the shifts in my perspective, I realized that only that morning I had contemplated the idea of making Jack beg and grovel to return home. Now the tables were turned, and I was unsure of the roles we would play in resolving our dilemma. I grabbed up my phone and began scrolling through my contacts. Fortunately, at least one of his pals knows where I can locate him. Spoiler. None of our mutual acquaintances knew anything. That wasn't exactly true. None of my prior common acquaintances who had remained friends with me knew anything. The countless mutual pals who now despised me knew enough, unfortunate leak. They had no problems about telling me, and they knew where I could locate him. They flatly refused to provide that information to me. When I inquired if they would deliver a message from me, they laughed. I had just completed my fourth and final drink, dejectedly. That's when Josh demonstrated his intelligence. Yes, it was spoken sarcastically. Perhaps it was just my mood or a product of the variations in how men and women think. Perhaps some of you will think Josh's suggestion was fantastic. Me? I do not think so, Josh began, as our lives were already messed up. Why don't we go to Kayla's and spend the night together as a foursome? We've already been carnal, so let's take advantage of it and have a night of passion. He believed that was great logic, but I just got a dose of common sense. Of course, if there is nothing left to lose, there may be something to ponder about. 
Personally, I believe Jack and I still have a small shot. That remote possibility would vanish as quickly as a drop of water on the sun's surface. I respectfully decline to allow everyone inside the house and have a late-night gathering with them, instead offering to let Mary escort them home. I was attempting to reconcile with my husband. I tried everything to locate Jack. On weekends, I traveled for hours around motel parking lots looking for his truck. I drove past all of his buddies' houses at various times to see if his truck was present. I even attempted to follow his best friend. When I saw him leave his residence, I hoped he'd go to where Jack was. Monday morning, I tented across the street from his workplace. Everyone entered, but Jack never showed up. I waited for another hour. Still nothing. Even though I was already late for work, I wasn't concerned. Screw it. They weren't going to fire me immediately away anyway, and I would still be fired after the compensation. But it didn't matter. I got out of the car and went to the office. I noticed that the door to Jack's office was closed, so I asked the receptionist if he was there. She informed me that he was gone for two weeks. Crap. When I arrived at work two hours late, the boss gave me an angry look. I didn't care. All of the phones I could have used were barred. His pals declined to help. I can't even send a message to him at work. I don't know where he is, so I can't show up on his doorstep. Mail is not an option because I'm not sure where to send it. What are my options? Email. He always checks. Email. I only hope he does not block my emails. There's no problem with attempting, Jack. No excuses. I will not waste time trying to provide one. I have got the fool sickness. My decision. Not blaming Mary. It was amazing to hear her speak on women's marriage. I have no idea why. I thought you might accept. Should have known better. Sorry for needing a wake-up call, but I am now awake. I want you to know that I am very embarrassed and repent my behavior. I understand. You may not accept it. Jack, despite my recent acts, I sincerely love you. You did not do anything wrong. It was just me being a complete fool and self-centered. Jack, my darling, even though I don't deserve it, please forgive me. I need to return and I'm ready to give you anything. I recognized how crazy it was to try to make feel him, but I would be delighted if he could be a part of my life. Yes, Jack, I'm giving you my soul and you're only giving me orders. I'll do anything to return to where I belong with you. I understand the definition of anything. Thank you, Jack. I'm offering you anything. Despite having no interest in women, I do things for you, such as serve you and your friends at a Super Bowl party while wearing only a garter belt, stockings, and high heels. If it leads me back to you. If you want me to do something specific, tell me to bend over the nearest chair. Regardless of who is looking, spank my spine cheeks with a leather belt. Tell me when and where. I will bring the belt. There is no reason to trust me, but as a condition for my return, I will wear a chastity belt and give you the keys. I had blood drawn for the results of an STD test in a few days. Tell me where to send them, and I will deliver them to you. Jack, regardless of what happens, you are the best person I have ever known. I know you would never purposefully injure me, even if I deserved it. I accept it all. I am not asking you to forget or trust me again. I'm requesting the opportunity to be yours in whatever capacity you wish. I only want to come back to you forever, even if I had to agree to a divorce or observe you with other women. I hope it does not happen. But I recognize it isn't my decision. I am at blame, and I know that you may wish to even the score. Goose Goosey. All of the stuff. What about Mary, Larry, Josh, and the lawsuit filed against my company? Mary tricked me into consenting to this scheme. Josh and Larry took advantage of it. As you are aware... I will be fired once the lawsuit is settled. It's entirely our fault. Do whatever you want with them. If you want, I can help. After all, I am your willing slave. From now on, your beloved slave. Kayla update. Fortunately, Jack has not blocked my email yet. Even more surprising, he actually read it. He did not take my word for it. After all, I had already broken the biggest promise I'd ever made. The one about leaving everyone behind. What made him believe that I wouldn't break any other promises now that I'd broken that one? All I could do was prove it to him. Take one action at a time. It had been two years since I sent that letter. Josh and Larry had divorce issues, and all four of us were fired the day after the company's lawsuit was settled. Josh and Larry eventually got lower-paying jobs and moved into a small apartment in a rough neighborhood. Their social lives suffered and their ex-wives turned the kids against them. I realized that both women are now in better relationships. 
Now it's my turn. Currently, I'm kneeling, undressed beside the bed, wearing a chastity belt while Jack finishes. This is my penance. I detailed all of this in a letter. Yes. Jack wanted to test me to see if I would honor those words, if I want him back. I don't have much choice. It was a tough six months, but eventually he eased up a bit. He still makes me do it sometimes, like now, but it's improved. Now he only brings other women home once every two months. After getting fired, I stopped working. Jack got a promotion, and we managed just fine without my income. I stay home taking care of our two-year-old twins. I'm undressed most of the time, though. Jack recently said I need to start wearing clothes at home soon. The kids are getting old enough that it feels weird otherwise. Right now, I only wear clothes when leaving the house or when we have guests. I still answer the door undressed for deliveries. I underwent laser hair removal, so I have a permanent landing strip over my genitals. This makes it impossible to hide my jack tattoo on the right side of the band and jack tattoo on the left side. Every week, Jack uses a leather strap to update the five red stripes on my buttocks. As I lean over the couch, he removes my plug and totally engages me after the sixth stroke. I'm not flawless. When I make mistakes, I get extra stripes on my buttocks or chest. But I truly enjoy it. Who knew the pain of a strap could create a bond? Mary. She's still married. True, she was also fired. However, no one anticipated her face any serious penalties. Her husband appeared completely obedient to her wishes. She'd be able to find another work and get on with her life. Is it true that life is not always fair? Indeed it is. Harold wasn't a passive loser. Everyone believed it. After gathering evidence, he became enraged. I thought I had a difficult six months, but in comparison to hers, it was easy. He decided he had sufficiently punished her and served her with divorce papers while torturing Mary. He secretly liquidated their assets and protected them. He gave her the house after refinancing it and taking all of the equity, and then disappeared. She lost her house and all of her money gone. She found another job, but at half her previous wage. She too has a bad reputation, but she is not currently dating. With another month of antibiotics ahead, you may be wondering why I am enduring this or laughing at my deserved destiny. If you're sad that Jack didn't abandon me, I'll thank God every day. He did not, however. I fully deserved it. I put up with it because I can't imagine not having my love. Even when Jack whips and humiliates me, he still loves me. He has other ladies, but not without me. I am free to go at any time. And Jack presented me divorce papers in which he claimed to be fair. I refused the offer. He is a terrific father, lover, and husband. I don't need anything more. I got so caught up in the idea of women's marriage that I lost sight of what was truly important. Instead of being content in an equal partnership, I became submissive to my husband. Here's the next story. At roughly 5.30 p.m. on Sunday, Beverly walked in via the front door, dropped her handbag and keys on the nightstand, and proceeded down the hallway to the master bedroom. I am not sure if she noticed me sitting in the office, but it didn't matter. Over the last few years, I've nearly become invisible to her while approaching her. I collected her keys, got my spare keys from her, and then searched her purse. I took her cell phone and wallet, removing all of the cash and credit cards from my wallet and stashing them in my pocket for safety. I also collected her driver's license before returning to my seat in the office 15 minutes later. Bev walked from the corridor, well-dressed, and noticed me as she swung her purse over her shoulder and grabbed her keys. She commented, I'm meeting some girls from work. Do not keep waiting. No, you are not going out with the girls from work. I filed a protest. You should already know, Jack. You don't have any control over me. She responded, I will do as I please. I never said you couldn't hang out with co-worker gals. I responded, you are not going to. You're going to see your guy, so please do not lie to me. I stated, Beverly remained motionless for a time before confidently entering the office and facing me. All right, Jack, I'd like to approach this differently, but let's end it here. You have two choices. Either salvage what's left of this marriage by allowing me some freedom, or face divorce and being cut out of my life. What is it going to be? She questioned. I'll take the third door, I replied with a smirk. Do not behave childishly. There are no doors. Number three, acknowledge that I now have a lover a genuine man. Beverly advised you to ready yourself for the repercussions. I got up, walked up to Bev and pushed her against the wall, removed the engagement and wedding rings from her left hand. 
I had my face near to hers and a strong stare in my eyes. I muttered fiercely, Here's your third door. When you depart via it, you are exiting my front door. It'll be the final time you leave with something and never return. You will not get any more of my money. You will lose your husband, daughter, home, money, vehicle, and job, eventually. You're living a fantasy, Jack, she mumbled anxiously. My lawyer will destroy you tomorrow. I'll forward the divorce paperwork to your employer. If you hurt me, you will suffer more than I will. I yanked her away from the wall and dragged her to the front door, forcing her to stumble as she yelled incoherently. Lee Bev fought to stay balanced. Her poise crumbled throughout our marriage. I had never touched her before, and she had no idea how to react as she regained consciousness in the front yard. I closed the door and locked it. The lock was already replaced earlier that day. As Bev left, I made the first of two phone calls. I called my 19-year-old daughter at college. Hi, this is Dad. Our relationship with your mother has reached a critical moment. It appears she will be moving in with her boyfriend and I need to speak with you about it. Just so you know, I taped our most recent chat, as well as many previous disputes. You can listen to them to find out the truth when she attempts to distort things and blame me, as she most likely will. The truth is, your mother has cheated. I don't know how many times she's chosen to leave us for this guy. I'll explain more soon. However, her guy appears to be shady, so proceed with caution in your friendship with her. I approached Patty and asked her to go home for the weekend. My objective was to have a talk and offer her the opportunity to listen to some cassettes if she so desired. Fortunately, Patty consented to return home on Friday after resolving that issue. I contacted Martha, our neighbor down the street. Hi, Martha. This is Jack, I explained over the phone. If the offer is still valid, I would like to accept it. Could you please come over in approximately an hour? I kept my explanation short. I felt compelled to confide in Martha. Bev and I had met young, married, and had Patty soon after. Things appeared fine at first, but Bev's demeanor shifted quickly. She became irritable, manipulative, and domineering. I did my best to keep the peace and make her happy, but it just seemed to make matters worse. Looking back, I understand I contributed to my own misery by continually attempting to please her. Our lives were a disaster now that we were in our forties. It wasn't long before I uncovered Bev's affair with Sylvester, also known as Sly, a man with a violent history. The idea that our marriage was beyond repair gave me a sense of peace, and I began preparing my next moves. I've heard stories where the husband steals half of the money. I proceeded, except for me. I took every single penny I could locate, including all of the cash in the home. I replaced the locks and intend to provoke Bev as much as possible. I knew her well enough to predict her reaction. She is hazardous in many ways, but this time she would also endanger herself. In reality, I began plotting long before I discovered Bev's affair. For years, I'd been secretly recording our arguments. Bev believed the item I was always carrying was a simple MP3 player, but, in actuality, I was creating a library of her tantrums to document her behavior. I knew no one would believe my stories unless I could provide proof because she exclusively mistreated me behind closed doors. I wanted to be able to share my experiences with everyone, including Patty, so that they could see Bev's genuine nature. On Monday, following our Sunday dispute, I held a meeting in the business break room. Overhead, a big banner read, Happy Divorce, with cake and ice cream ready. I eagerly anticipated the process server's arrival. Fortunately, the task was carried out by a nicely plump female. Several images were taken as my co-workers, and I celebrated receiving our divorce papers. I even grabbed a photo while taking the papers, kissing the serving girl's cheek as she wore a festive hat. In another photo, I'm feeding her cake, and we're both smiling. After the celebration, I emailed the images to Bev, along with others from the event. Among them were photos of myself and my roommate Martha, sitting in bed with the blankets drawn up, smiling broadly. I hoped Bev would notice Martha's wedding bands on her left hand, which rested on my chest. An hour later, I received an irate phone call. My lawyer is going to tear you apart after seeing these images, you rascal. What a terrible move. Not really, Bev. There is nothing wrong in these photographs. No nudity, just neighborhood pranks and lighthearted images. I responded. We'll discuss this later, Jack. I'll stop by the house this evening to get some stuff. It could be best if you don't attend. If I'm not there, you won't be able to enter, or the locks have been changed. If you require anything, arrive before 645. Martha and I have plans at 7 o'clock. 
and I don't want to be late. Last night was the most wonderful proximity I'd ever had. Tonight promises to be much better. With that, I ended the conversation and disregarded her next five attempts. While I haven't returned all of her calls since, I have listened to every message. Unlike other males in comparable situations, Bev's angry communications had the potential to slip up or divulge a secret. In fact, she did reveal herself multiple times in the next weeks. At 4.30 that day, I drove to Bev's workplace parking lot, hoping to arrive before the evening rush, and confirmed the lack of security cameras. What I had to do was quickly come up alongside Bev's car. I circled around her, severing all of her tire valve stems with wire cutters. She'd be outraged, and there'd be no way to fix them in time to get home by 645. She first appeared around 635, though. She'd been out with someone who was desperate to get home, as evidenced by receipts for clothing she hadn't brought with her. I knew she had a lot stashed at her lover's place. She must have wanted something else before slipping out the back door. I dashed to Martha's house, leaving Bev banging on the front door and shouting. Upon my return that evening, my front window had shattered. Blood splattered around it. After reviewing the port security footage, I contacted the authorities. In the video, Bev smashes the window with a tire iron. Her threats to harm me rang clear. Unfortunately for her, the lock I'd installed required a key from each side. As she recoiled, she slashed her forearm deeply, eliciting more screams and threats. I quickly reported the incident, and an officer assisted me in filing a restraining order. The next morning, Bev was served with papers prohibiting her from coming within 500 feet of me or our house. To say she was furious is an understatement. What are you doing, idiot? Her next call was filled with rage and renewed threats. I meticulously documented our entire conversation. After a few hours, she had calmed down. She called back. This time, she mentioned sending her friend Lindsay to pick up some of her belongings that evening. What could she be attempting to retrieve from the house, I found myself wondering. Suspicion is brewing. I agreed to meet with Lindsay at 5.30 p.m. on Tuesday to prepare. I left work a bit early to set up a video camera in my bedroom with a monitor discreetly installed in my office. Lindsay arrived promptly, and I greeted her warmly as she packed some clothes into two black plastic trash bags. I sat on the bed and observed. Lindsay looked at me nervously and then requested water from the kitchen. I smiled and left. Upon glancing at the monitor, I noticed Lindsay pulling a shoebox from her closet and placing it into a bag nearby. She then resumed selecting clothes upon her return with water. I observed her continuing to pack. She declared that it should suffice and requested me to take one bag while she took the other, noting that the one she held seemed heavier. I offered to assist Lindsay, but she declined, insisting she was fine and asking me to grab another bag as she began to fidget and move towards the door with her package. I questioned if there was anything in the package I should be aware of. I grasped her wrist and opened the package, to which she responded anxiously, explaining that it contained clothes and items that Bev needed. Realizing her lie, I confronted Lindsay about the odor emanating from the box, and upon opening it I found stacks of worn $1.50 and $1.100 bills, accusing her of attempting to steal from me. I rose to my feet and escorted her towards the exit and down the hallway. Lindsay claimed that the money belonged to Bev, and that she was merely sent to collect it, denying any intention of theft. However, I pointed out that she came to my house supposedly for clothes, but was leaving with a box of money which, in my view, constituted theft, threatening to call the police. I insisted that she prepare to be arrested for robbery. In response, Lindsay pleaded with me not to involve the authorities, citing her children and husband. I seated her on the couch and expressed my disappointment, stating that she would never be welcome in my house again. Despite her protests and tears, I made it clear that if she wished to make amends for her wrongdoing, she had only one chance. You'll leave this house and inform Bev that I caught you stealing. Then you'll report everything you hear or see to me, especially regarding our divorce or her relationship with Sly. You won't divulge anything about our arrangement. Bev made a terrible mistake getting involved with this loser, and you'll ultimately help her leave him. I informed Lindsay that if she cooperated with me, I had the entire incident on video, and I could call the police and file a report against her at any time. Reluctantly, Lindsay agreed to act as my informant as soon as she departed. I took the box of money and walked to Martha's house at the end of the block. 
She agreed to conceal it for me until I could safely stash it somewhere beyond Bev's reach. I knew the likely source of the money. Bev's Aunt Mabel, known for her stinginess, passed away a few months ago, leaving Bev as her sole heir. While I knew Aunt Mabel had left Bev a small rural cottage, there was never any mention of money. It seemed that when Bev inspected the cabin after the whistle reading, she stumbled upon her aunt's hidden cash. When my wife Bev called, enraged and screaming, I recorded the conversation cautiously. This money is mine, Jack. I want my damn money, she was yelling. Bev, I'm not sure what you're talking about. I caught Lindsay trying to pilfer money from my nightstand. This is mine. You know exactly what I'm referring to. The money in the shoebox is mine. It's from Aunt Mabel, I retorted. Maybe Lindsay found some money in a shoebox, but if so, she likely took it and kept it for herself. I don't have it. And if you had money here, unknown to me, you didn't report it on your taxes last year. I've reviewed our tax returns. You're welcome to involve the police, and then we'll inform the IRS about this money, letting them handle your tax evasion. She snapped before hanging up. I felt a need for retaliation. I'd pushed Bev's buttons too hard for her to simply disappear. Restricted by a restraining order from leaving her house, I anticipated she might retaliate against me through my car, considering I'd previously vandalized hers. Hence, I had a dashboard-mounted camera installed. But it wasn't sufficient. If she chose that route, I wanted clear footage. Thus, when I parked in front of the garage on Wednesday morning, I set up an exterior camera, discreetly positioned it, streamed video to my desk, accessible an hour before lunch. I watched on my laptop as Bev parked behind my car, got out and began smashing it with a hammer, shattering windows and denting panels. The sight of her breaking the windshield and yelling sent a shiver down my spine. I dialed emergency and a police car awaited her as she left the driveway, presenting the video evidence of my damaged Toyota. The authorities arrested Bev, recognizing her actions as a criminal offense. The resisting arrest charge was an added bonus as she was led away. Her pleading eyes met my silent stare. Bev's divorce lawyer phoned me Wednesday, notifying me of a court hearing regarding access to the money withdrawn from our joint accounts set for Thursday at 10 a.m. I arrived at 950, wondering if Bev had posted bail. She entered with her lawyer wearing a smug expression. Addressing the judge, her lawyer asserted, Your Honor, my client was denied access to the shared bank accounts after she filed for divorce. Her husband illicitly emptied them. We're requesting a 5050 split. Hello, Mr. Reynolds. Would you like to address the court? Yes, Your Honor. My wife, who has been unfaithful, has been withdrawing her own funds from our joint accounts for months. The money I withdrew was fair compensation. Since I cover rent and bills, she abandoned our marriage to be with her, a fair partner. Bev Rose objecting. That's untrue. He drained our savings and checking accounts, leaving me with nothing. Her lawyer intervened, guiding her back to her seat for a brief conference while I presented documents to the judge. Your Honor, these bank statements cover last year. You'll see highlighted amounts, including Bev's salary up until a few months ago, along with periodic bonuses. Then about six months ago, her deposits ceased, including bonuses. I have a recorded conversation with her HR confirming her direct deposit switch to her personal account. The total amount diverted from our joint account is significant. It's evident my unfaithful wife possesses substantial wealth obtained from our marriage. The judge scrutinized the bank statements and then addressed Beverly. Do you have any response, Ms. Reynolds? Her lawyer rose cautiously, stating, Your Honor, even if my client has personal funds, Mr. Reynolds is still obligated to provide her with her fair share. Well, Counselor, I don't appreciate deceit, Miss. Reynolds claimed she was destitute, yet she entered with you. It's clear she was financially supported from marital assets, deceiving her husband and the court. Since Mr. Reynolds covers expenses from his own funds, there's no reason to alter the financial arrangements. Property division will be addressed in the final divorce decree. Case closed. As I left, Bev confronted me in the hallway. I began noting her threats. Bev, you're violating the restraining order. I'll contact the police if you don't leave. By the way, how is jail ready for more time there? You're facing criminal charges, though. She seemed ready to retaliate. I continued toward the exit. She stood, fists clenched, face flushed.
Later that evening, I went to a different bar where I had previously encountered an intriguing man named Zeke. Fortunately, he was there. I greeted him and asked if he remembered me, to which he replied that my name wasn't important. Zeke then mentioned that he still had the beat-up car expressing his disdain for the car. He explained that his wife had taken the good one when she left with her new lover. He complained about the broken air conditioning and his inability to afford a replacement. I inquired about his car insurance and suggested that if he followed my advice, I might be able to help him get something better. Zeke responded by saying he was listening. Let's imagine you're driving down 38th Street and suddenly a gray cat dashes out in front of you. Naturally, you hit the brakes and there's a chance the lady behind you might rear-end your lousy car at speeds over 15 miles per hour. Your car could end up totaled, but as long as you're firmly against the headrest with your seatbelt on, you should be okay. Insurance will take care of the damages. Plus, you could at least afford a car with air conditioning. But what if the lady who hits me gets injured? I can't do that to her. Well, I can assure you she'll be an unfaithful wife, and there won't be anyone else in her car, if you follow my instructions. What do you think about that? Man, that would be great. I can't stand cheaters, and I definitely need to get rid of this car park at the corner of 38th and Lessing by 5 p.m. tomorrow. Keep an eye out for a blue Miata, leaving the parking lot and heading your way. Pull out in front of it. She doesn't like passing other cars, so drive a block or so until she's tailing you. Then you'll spot a cat darting across the road. Get ready and hit the brakes hard. Just stay in the car. Afterward, dial emergency and mention a possible neck injury. And by the way, we've never met. I won't be returning in this bar, and we don't know each other. Dude, I'm colder than the AC in your new automobile. On Friday, I left work early to meet my daughter at home as scheduled. She finished her classes and returned on Sunday evening. We addressed the divorce scenario, and I showed her a recording of my chat with her mother concerning door number three. Patty was surprised by her mother's nasty tone and demands. Then I provided recordings from the past two years, revealing a side of Bev she'd never known. What do you know about the guy mom's with, Dad? I know he's trouble, and I want you to remain clear of him. If you must meet your mom, make sure it's in a public place. I don't know what he's capable of to get to me. In any event, always have something to protect yourself. If there's even a clue, he might be nearby. Patty... I knew your mom and I had our troubles, but I never realized the magnitude of it. What went wrong between us? This was a question I had to anticipate, so I proceeded to provide a reduced version of my position to Patty. I explained to her that her mother and I had profoundly different opinions about marriage. After some thought, I informed Patty that I had identified four major ways in which power can be distributed in a relationship. There are times when neither party takes the initiative, resulting in a situation where everything drifts aimlessly like a ship without a rudder. Alternatively, both partners may accept responsibility, resulting in constant battles for dominance or a division of control over various aspects of the relationship. Some couples may even share responsibility equally, as I expected when we first started dating. However, things didn't go as planned. Another scenario occurs when the man takes complete control, while such an arrangement may work in certain situations, modern perceptions frequently view such paternalistic relationships as oppressive to women. However, if a man completely devotes himself to his wife, it can be like a fairy tale romance, providing a fulfilling life to a wife with the right temperament, free of the burden of difficult decisions. Alternatively, it could mirror your maternal grandparents' dynamic with your grandmother passive and your grandfather dominant and sometimes harsh. Your mother most likely grew up seeing this and anticipated a similar power dynamic in our relationship. As a result, when I attempted to share equal footing with her, she saw it as a sign of weakness on my part, which led to increased disrespect despite all my efforts to please her. This leads me to the final scenario, a relationship in which the wife dominates. When I failed to meet her expectations of a good person, it appears that your mother decided to take charge. She turned cruel. She determined which projects should be completed and insisted that they meet her standards. Countless times, she started family projects only to micromanage every detail, leaving many unfinished because I couldn't stand feeling emasculated in my own home. She even taught me how to hold tools while working, which makes such situations unbearable. When a wife dominates, it goes against human nature. I don't understand how this dynamic can function. 
While the husband may remain loving and affectionate, the wife loses respect for him as she asserts control. I believe this dynamic is reflected in our relationship. Beverly took my resistance as a sign of a lack of responsibility. She already thought I was weak by that point. When I refused to be bossed around, she regarded me as a rebellious child. I doubt I'll ever reclaim her respect. This divorce may be my final chance to recoup it. I told Patty that she would understand my actions once she realized how difficult it was to express my dislike for her mother's lifestyle. I advised her that mutual respect was essential when making major decisions in her future relationships, such as starting a family or deciding on careers and homes. I emphasized the value of both Patty and her partner, understanding what to expect in order to avoid the unhappy situation. Beverly and I got ourselves into this situation. In response, Patty assured me that she would remember my advice and take it into consideration. Shortly afterwards, the phone rang. Hello, Mr. Reynolds. The name of the hospital is Memorial. Your wife was involved in a car accident. She is stable and not severely injured, but she will stay with us for the night. Patty and I drove to the hospital, and I let her go into the room first. She did not stay long, and I then requested to speak with Bev alone. When she emerged with a downcast expression, I suspected Patty had spoken harshly to her. God, you look awful, Bev, I remarked with a slight smile. What a terrible week. You lose your marriage, husband, and home. Then you're served a restraining order and arrested for a felony. Next, you lose some of your anticipated funds. And now your car is totaled. You're in the hospital with a broken wrist and a bruised face from the airbag. This divorce appears to be going very well for me. Do you feel strange? She responded. Where is Bev's old sly charm? Has he paid you a visit yet? Don't worry. He's probably occupied with one of his other two women right now. Her complexion turned pale. You probably had no idea about the others when you started this. Well, it appears you now know. I'm curious how long it will be before he wants you to serve one of them. I never thought of you as a people pleaser, but given how much you'll need it in prison, it might be a useful skill to develop. I will not go to jail. My lawyer will have these false charges dismissed. Really? You crash my car and endanger my health, and you think you'll get off easily? Because when I spoke with the district attorney, he made it clear that he is after you. He has photographic evidence and an impending election to win. Now he wants to appear as a hero fighting crime. I believe he'll seek the maximum penalty. She just sat there staring at me. Have you decided which car insurance company to contact? I inquired. Automobile insurance. What are you talking about? We're still dealing with the same issues. Wait, so you didn't get any insurance when you filed for divorce this week? I removed your car from my insurance policy. You must have known about this because you insisted on only having your name on your Miata. If you did not get insurance this week, you are in big trouble. You'll face fines, towing fees, and three years of payments. That Miata might end up in a junkyard while you're still paying for it. And because you won't have a job after your felony conviction, you might not need another car. In addition, you will most likely have to pay the medical bills for the person you hit. His insurance company will demand payment for the damages. Damn it. But at least you have your own health insurance, right? I'm on yours. No, no. On Monday, I removed you from my health insurance. Didn't you also take care of that? Baby, you're in big trouble. The ambulance ride to the emergency room. Visit x-rays, doctor's fees, and arm cast, hospitalization, and follow-up. Care will cost thousands upon thousands of dollars. Hey, speaking of medicine... I was thinking about when you got sick a couple of years ago. Remember that I took a week off to take care of you. I held your head while you vomited and cleaned up after you couldn't get to the restroom in time. I called the doctor and went to the pharmacy to get you some medicine. Then, a week later, when you were feeling better, you resumed scolding, insulting, and calling me names. I'm wondering how well old Sly will look after you the next time you get sick. Now that you believe Sly is over his other woman, it's time for me to call him. I hope you have a good life. Beverly sat in tears as I left, but I stopped caring. For a while, things continued as usual. Lindsay and I kept in touch on occasion. She began to worry about Sly's influence over Bev. Lindsay gradually moved away from her. Then, one evening, as I returned home and approached my front door, I was assaulted on the lawn. I was on the lookout for potential attacks, but this one caught me off guard. 
A guy in a ski mask knocked the wind out of me, twisted my arm behind my back, and demanded that I give him the box of money and inform the DA to dismiss the charges. I felt helpless, but I kept the car alarm remote in my hand. I pressed the panic button, which set off the alarm. Sly became enraged, hit me again, and then fled as the neighbor's porch lights turned on and people began to look outside. I yelled for someone to call an emergency, and a police officer arrived shortly after. I wasn't seriously injured enough to warrant an ambulance, and Sly was long gone. Because none of my neighbors could identify him, he was not punished for the attack. The next day, I told my daughter about it, which was even more shocking. Dad, I didn't want to tell you, but I had an encounter with Sly. Mom called to talk to me. I agreed, but insisted on meeting outside of his apartment. She asked me to pick her up, but when I arrived, she seated me on their couch. Then Sly emerged and spoke to me. He stated that Mom was not dealing well with her injuries in bed. I would have to attend to his needs. He claimed she owed him money, and I'd have to pay it. When I looked at my mother, she simply stared at the floor, saying nothing. Sly told me to get her to comply. Mom pleaded with me, Please, baby, stay with him. It will not be too bad, and I really need you to do it for me. He then approached me, grabbed my wrist, and tried to force me to stand up, claiming we were going to the bedroom while I had my right hand on the pepper spray in my purse. When he pulled me away, I sprayed it on his face. He screamed and grabbed his face while I grabbed my purse and attempted to pull my mother out the door. But she resisted and moved toward him. I yelled at her to join me, but she chose to help him in the bathroom. So I departed. I can't believe my own mother attempted to set me up with that idiot. I'm not sure if I'll ever forgive her for this. As any father in my situation would be, I was fuming in the bedroom, thinking about my Beretta. I almost grabbed it. After a while, my daughter reassured me that she was not damaged and advised me to think about the future. I made Patty promise not to walk alone until after the trial and to always keep protection with her. She agreed to date only other students and never be alone in public. I gradually regained my composure. Sly encouraged me to speak with the district attorney, but he had no idea what I would say. I played a recording of my daughter discussing Sly and reminded him of Sly's attack on me. The DA asked if I would consider leniency toward Bev or dropping the charges. Certainly not. I insisted on seeking the maximum penalty. Bev is under the control of this manipulative individual, and separating them is the only way to help her. A stint in prison might help her get on track. The district attorney agreed, and the trial moved forward. I felt fairly confident at home and at work, but there were moments of vulnerability, particularly when entering and exiting the garage. However, I was cautious throughout my commute. Our house is about ten miles down the ranch road, with only one turnoff for the next fifteen miles. I was well aware of other possible danger zones during the lengthy drive home. I kept my Beretta with me one evening a few days before Bev's trial. About two miles from home, I noticed the headlights of a pickup truck behind me, which sent shivers down my spine. It was soon tailgating me aggressively, only 20 feet from my rear bumper, at 55 miles per hour. As I accelerated to 70 miles per hour, I dialed 911 and activated the voice recorder. The pickup maintained a frantic pace. I asked the emergency operator to contact the detective who was investigating my assault. The truck followed me for another five miles as I narrated the situation, the pistol lying next to me. As I approached a bridge spanning a small creek bed, I braced myself for any potential danger. I expected the driver to try to force me off the road as we approached the bridge about a hundred yards away. The pickup accelerated, indicating its intention to force me off the road. As the car pulled up next to me, I caught a glimpse of Bev's face in the passenger seat. I braked hard, causing the car to skid but maintaining control. Although the truck stopped ahead of me, my quick braking kept us from colliding. My car skidded to a stop by the roadside. Its rear rests on a slope leading down to the creek bed, allowing it to exit the car. I grabbed my weapon, phone, and recorder and began descending the steep gravel slope beneath the bridge. As I descended, I noticed the pickup's brake lights illuminate as it navigated through the darkness. I carefully felt my way underneath the bridge. Despite the possibility of encountering a rattlesnake, I was more concerned with other threats. I'm taking in deep breaths. I searched for a safe hiding place, eventually stopping and tilting the Beretta. I waited anxiously but received no response for a while. 
Emergency contact via cell phone was lost. Trying to redial in the dark proved futile due to poor signal reception. I found myself stuck. It was unclear whether help was on its way. At least there was no ominous growl from the pickup truck overhead. I determined to remain stationary. I am ready to spend the night there if necessary. It seemed like an eternity, but it was probably only five or ten minutes until I heard a siren in the distance. Approaching from the same direction and realizing they were far behind, I began walking up the hill, leaving the Beretta under the bridge and raising my hands as I approached the road. I begged the arriving cops not to shoot. I see two cars parked across the road, blocking both lanes. I heard sirens on the other side and saw a pickup truck driving back to the bridge. I stumbled and fell into the mud. Although my perspective was limited, I heard the pickup skid to a halt and officers ordered the driver to exit and lie on the ground. Other police cars that were following the pickup came to a stop behind it. Bev and Sly were quickly arrested on attempted murder charges, despite their deep concern. I returned home, showered, and tried to sleep unsuccessfully. When your spouse is charged with multiple felonies, divorce appears to be an easy decision. The judge expressed sympathy, and Bev and her lawyer put up little resistance. Bev, desperate to reduce her prison sentence, proposed giving up nearly everything in the divorce in exchange for help in reducing her punishment. During the sentencing hearing, I testified about Bev's previous virtues prior to falling under Sly's influence. I expressed a willingness to forgive her for attempting to end my life after admitting her infidelity and years of torment. In court, I was unable to interpret her facial expression, so I did not address her directly. Finally, Sly received a lengthy prison sentence. I hope he shares a cell with a burly inmate named Bubba, who finds him particularly attractive. The judge was more lenient with Bev, but she won't be eligible for parole for at least three years. So Bev has been incarcerated for about four years now. The district attorney's office informed me that she was granted parole about a year ago. I kept waiting to hear from her, knowing she wasn't in touch with Patty. Revenge appeared promising, but it failed to live up to expectations. I couldn't stop thinking about what had happened so unexpectedly. I contacted my ex-wife, Bev. Hello, this is Jack. I have something of yours and would like to return it. I called the rehab facility where Bev lived. There was no response for a few moments. Beverly, I would like to give you a shoebox. Are you able to hear me? Can we arrange a meeting so I can return it to you? I thought she was going to hang up, but she eventually responded. Where? When? I don't really care. We decided to meet at a neutral location, just like a restaurant. Alternatively, she could visit me at home. I proposed Sunday. Do you have a free Sunday? After a brief pause, she said, I'll be there on Sunday at 2 p.m. The phone rang. How do you prepare to confront your ex-wife, your child's mother, the woman who tried to kill you, and a convicted felon? When Bev arrived, I prepared lemonade and cookies. Neither of us attempted to shake hands or embrace. We said hello, and I motioned for her to enter the office. Her hair was much shorter than usual, and her eyes were stern. She wasn't wearing much, if any, makeup anymore. At 50, she appeared to be 65. The coffee table held drinks, cookies, and a shoebox. She sat opposite the sofa, and I offered her a soft drink, which she declined. Did she really believe I would try to poison her? If you don't want lemonade and cookies, perhaps all you need is the shoebox and whatever else we have to say to each other. So what's the catch, Jack? What do you prefer instead? Is there any left? She remained very suspicious. Bev, there's no trick. Everything is there. Except for a few thousand dollars, which I contributed with an equal amount of my own money and gave to Patty as a down payment on her home when she married. If you prefer, she can begin returning your share at your leisure. I just gave her my portion. Bev's expression indicated that she was unaware of Patty's marriage. Patty has been married for two years and you are already a grandmother. I could see the tension in her eyes as she struggled with her emotions. Shannon Beverly Evans is the little girl's name. Her other grandmother is named Shannon. Regardless of her efforts, Bev's eyes welled up with tears. Bev, I know you haven't spoken with Patty in a while. There must be a way for you to connect. If you want, I can make that happen. Beverly gave a nod. Tears are now streaming down her cheeks. I reached for the box of tissues that I had placed on the coffee table. If you aren't ready to leave yet, I'll give you an abridged version of our story. I replied gently. She wipes the tears from her cheek and tries to calm down. 
Patty met a wonderful man named Stan Evans. He enjoys computers and networking. They seem to get along well. She is an excellent mother, and they are deeply committed to each other. Martha and I did not last long. She is too young for me, and she only needed me temporarily until she could get her life back on track. She found somebody else and moved on. I date on occasion, but I end things if they become too serious. I'm better off on my own. I'll remain single. There was some silence. I'm going to express some thoughts, primarily for my own benefit. But perhaps you can also learn something from them. I sincerely hope so. I could not wait to see you in prison. I despised you and wished you dead numerous times. But when they locked you up, my emotions shifted. I found that I couldn't enjoy my victory any longer, so I let go of my animosity toward you, even though you never requested it. I forgive you because I know you weren't entirely to blame. I could not understand you until it was too late. And then we stopped communicating. We were just bickering. Beverly gathered her thoughts and looked up from the floor. She gave me a lost expression but remained silent. That is the truth, put succinctly and plainly. If you have nothing else to say and aren't hungry, I won't keep you any longer. You most likely have important things to attend to. She stood up and took the box as she walked toward the front door for the first time since I pushed her away all those years before. I called her out. Beverly, it doesn't matter right now, and you're not required to respond if you don't want to. But I'm curious. Throughout our time together, especially on the final day you were here, it was obvious that you saw me as weak. Do you still think I am a pushover, Bev? She paused with her hand on the doorknob and returned my gaze. She expressed her feelings bitterly, claiming that she hated me and thought I had been cruel and that I had ruined her life. After a pause, she added that she did not think I was a pushover. Thank you for taking the time to hear today's story. If you enjoyed this article, please like and subscribe if you haven't already. If you have a story to tell about your or someone else's situation, please do not hesitate to contact me. Please take care.